Wow. <laughs> wow. Um, so, one of the, uh, you know, I, I'm just so amazed. Give a round of applause for you guys. <laughs> Can you hear me in the back? Yeah. Okay, that was a little bit mixed, so I'll go over here. So, you know, wow. <laughs> well, how's that? Good? Okay. So, yeah, come on, give it up. So, you know, it takes, it takes a village like this, I think, to raise a, a child. And many people who know me well know that I am a child. <laughs> um, so, um, I was going to read a quote about children. We're at the Strand, so I thought, hey, let's start off with a literary quote, and that's by James Baldwin. <laughs> Children have never been good at listening to their elders, but they have never failed to imitate them. And uh, so sitting here, I was thinking, you know, this book is about enjoyment. It's really not only about being great. It's about learning how to enjoy the ride at the same time. Not just focusing on greatness, on being the best, but on focusing on enjoying that process. So I just have to take a borrow a minute from your time. I borrowed 25, but I'll just borrow one more. And I just want to enjoy a moment here. I'd just like to ask Liz and Jeff Fader to stand up. These are the people that taught me about enjoyment. And so I feel so grateful and thankful to both of you. So thank you so much. The reason I bring them up too is because it was here as a child that I learned what a book was. And I'm just so honored to be in the place where I first saw books and was bored out of my mind by them as my parents walked around this place. It's an honor to be at the Strand. It's an honor to be in the place where, where I grew up. It's an honor to be in New York City, the place of my birth, the place of many of your births. So I'd also like to just, before I start, take a moment to just appreciate the absolute loveliest of lovely ladies. Can you three please stand up and turn around? As I say in the dedication, these are the people that I play hard with every day, and I'm so delightful, I'm so delighted to have them here as I am to have all you guys. So, um, you know, speaking of, um, speaking of, of the things that are in the book about, about an enjoyment, I just wanted to ask you guys, before I talk about why I wrote the book, I want to ask you a question. And here's the question. I'd like to know if you have something that you're hoping to get better at or change in your life. And if you do, if you feel like in your life there's something you want to get better at or change, I just want you to clap your hands. Go ahead and applaud. <laughs> Let's just practice for the end of the talk. I just <laughs> Now I just want you to say, if there's something that has stressed you in the past year, something that's stressed you out, that's brought you some level of stress, something that's a level of stress that's bothered, impeded you, blocked you, go ahead and clap your hands. <laughs> so before we get back to that, I want to tell you a story. I was going down to spring training, and I was about to give a big, big talk in spring training. Okay, I'm, I am pumped. I have a whole routine that I do before I give a talk. I did it back there. I listen to little Rolling Stones. I do some breathing, get myself centered. And I was doing all that stuff. I was ready to go. I get there, and I'm talking to a bunch of professional athletes, and I just think I just killed it. I'm just like, oh my god, I was nervous for nothing. I, I did a great job. I really did a great job. I went out there, I talked, I felt great about myself. I get on the plane, I'm coming home, I'm texting my family. I put my phone on airplane mode. 
sleep out on the guy next to me, wake up, as everybody does, as soon as the rubber hits the tarmac, we all swipe up and turn off airplane mode, and ding, 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 all these alerts come in my phone, I'm back in it, right? And one of the emails is from the coaches, from the team. Just wanted to say, Fader, you did a great job. Great job. But after your talk, one of your competitors came in. And they did also a great talk. So we posted their information in the clubhouse instead. My heart sank. I, I just felt like at the bottom of an ocean, right? And I looked down and I opened up the, the, the email, the, the photo of, of the thing that they posted there. And it said, freakycounselors.com. Get your freak on. Get your freak on. <laughs> so it was a joke, right? They were just teasing me. It was a weird way. It's kind of a way to welcome to the club. <laughs> But what it reveals is an ambivalence that we have about getting better. For so many years, psychology, psychiatry, mental health was about fixing what's wrong. There's a deficit, there's a problem, something we gotta work out. And this book in the field of sport and performance psychology is everybody, all of you guys, have something you wanna get better at. Every single person here, nothing wrong. You just have something you want to get better at. You have something that's stressing you out. And this is one of the paths to that getting better and getting great. So the ambivalence that's in professional sports is in all of us. We're taking psychology in sports psychology and saying, this is as much as about it is getting better as it is fixing something that's wrong. Just another story about ambivalence. I work with a lot of Spanish-speaking players right, in, in the minor leagues. And one of the things that they used to call me, the word for, anybody know the word for, for psychologist in Spanish? Shout it out so everybody can hear. Psicologo. Except they call me psicoloco. <laughs> You're ambivalent, right? We don't know. So this book is taking all the ideas of what's wrong and saying, hey, what can you do if you just want to get better? There's nothing wrong. You just want to get better in your life. This is what we do with professional athletes at the highest level. Because as you go up in professional athletics, everybody is sort of around the same. And it's really that mental advantage, how you're going to train to be the best, which I'm going to tell you guys about, um, that really differentiates people as it differentiates you in your life as an attorney, a teacher, a mom, a dad, a partner, a photographer, or yes, even a sport and clinical psychologist. So to tell you another story about how this works, I want to you know, just put, pinpoint some of the work I've done um, with the fire department, with FDNY. So the fire department, where, where is the FDNY up in here? Raise, raise, raise the roof, FDNY, come on. These are, these are the guys that, yeah, raise it up, come on. I've been doing some really exciting and to me really important work with FDNY. And, um, I really feel, I enjoy it because I feel the meaning behind it, a huge meaning. And you know, what I really like to do is if I'm going to help out a group of people, I want to go in and see what it's like. I want to feel it out. So they were gracious enough to take me along on one of their drills. So at Randall's Island, there's a place called The Rock. That's already scary, right? When somebody's called The Rock, you're like, let's stay away from it, whether it's an actor or something out there. You're like, whoa, big and scary. So there's a place called The Rock. So they take me out to The Rock for a drill. And the drill consists of that they have a whole city built out there for training. It's amazing. Subway cars and buses. And uh, so they take me on this drill and they were like, okay, we're going to go into this burning building here. And you're going to go in, you're going to have oxygen mask on, and you're going to go in, they're going to light it up on fire, and you're going to go in with us and see what it's really like. I'm like, yeah, no problem. They were, I'm only here with the best. They're training me. I'm like, I'm ready to go. Let's do this. See what happens if I do this. Oh my God. Okay. So I go into this burning, sorry, let me back up. So we're out there and they, they bring out all the guys on the fire truck. They drive it up to the front of, the of this actual burning building, right? And these guys jump out and they saw off with a chainsaw the locks. And we go inside. And I'm, in my mind, I'm thinking, okay, I'm ready for this. I, you know, I know what I'm doing here and I'm going to go in and we'll go after, you know, these guys. These are the best, the best firefighters in New York. These are the guys that, that save, you know, well, I'll get back to that. So we got stuck in the elevator on the way up here, literally, for three minutes. And I actually saw Jason Bresler, one of the, the, the elite F FDNY fi firefighters, on my way up. I saw him and we got stuck and I'm looking out at the glass and thinking, that guy could save us. But, <laughs> so they, they saw off the locks, right? 
And all of a sudden, these firefighters rush in. I have this, this uh, mask on, and one of the, I the instincts you have when you have those masks on, whether you're scuba diving, if you've scuba dived, you know this, is to take it off. If you take it off, you're going to inhale the smoke and be seriously injured or die. So I, I, I go to take off my mask, and all of a sudden, I'm like, okay, I can't do that. And I go in, and what happens? I'm in there in the middle of the smoke, can't see anything. I'm using a thermal regulator to, to find my way. What happens? What happens? Panic. All of a sudden, my heart starts racing, right? I, I feel tense. I, all these things go through my head. I don't even know where I am. It didn't also help that I kept peering through the radio. Where's the doctor? Who's got the doctor? Where's the doctor? Who's got the doctor? <laughs> so I finally find myself, and the way I found myself is what I talk about in the book. I have a routine. I know what to do when I get to adversity. I don't wait for it to happen. I know that breathing, I know that actually thinking in an adaptive way, thinking things like, I've been trained for this, and also, I'm here with the best. Also, messaging myself, all I have to do is hold the air tank in front of me and walk. And that's what really got me through it. Now, if I didn't have that routine, they might have had to find the doctor, right, laid out on the floor. <laughs> what you see there is what's known a lot of in, in science as the growth mindset. When you are challenged, when you have a, something that's in your way, an obstacle, the one you thought of, you have two options. You can either think about it as a challenge or a threat. Whether you're giving a toast as the best man or the best woman, whether you're up here, you can think of it as a challenge or a threat. And that growth mindset idea helped me in that moment when I was working with FDNY. It's helped me when I'm here talking to you. I'm enjoying the heck out of this. Do you guys know that when I walked in, I talked to my man right here. Tell me your name again. Stefan. Stefan. Uh, I talked to Peter. Where's Peter at? I talked to Peter. He's back there in the back. See his hands waving. They told me that this is the fullest they've ever remembered. They can can't remember this room being that full. That's you guys. Give it up. <laughs> so enjoyment the book is not only about these mental skills I've been talking about, it's about enjoyment. And, and what does that mean? I thought I'd just tell you a quick story about what enjoyment is, and that's a story um, about Pele. Raise your hand if you know who Pele is. <laughs> no good. Sometimes, I, look, I've been in a lot of baseball groups where, you know, they're like, what is it, soccer, football? Okay. So Pele, world-famous soccer player. You guys with me? Yeah, okay. So, so Pele, the world-famous soccer player, the story about him is amazing. This is how Pele would get ready for a game. What Pele would do is before his game, he would visualize, which is the skill I talk about in the book. If you go into your mind, you close your eyes, and you imagine you're a piano player, and you imagine playing the piano in your mind, right? You're a teacher, you imagine teaching in vivid, using all of your five senses. Your brain doesn't really know the difference. There's a lot of evidence to suggest that that helps you to actually do the thing that you want to do in that muscle memory. So anyway, Paley, what he would do is he'd take it a step further. He would actually go back and do some visualization, reminding himself of playing soccer on the beach and in Rio as a kid. And that enjoyment of rem reminding himself what it was like to be a kid playing soccer helped him to go out there and play that game every day, to turn that job, which we all have, we all have a job, into something enjoyable. So what, what I work on with athletes and high performers is to create a level of enjoyment in their work by asking themselves, what do I enjoy most about this? And I'll use an example for myself. When I came in here, all I was concerned about was giving an effective, interesting talk. I had to stop myself and say, these are the people that, that are the reason that I'm here. And to step back and do that in every moment, what is it that I enjoy most about what I'm doing? Even the things that are hard. So the thing I just want to talk about, and then I'll take some questions, um, is just bringing me back to why I wrote this book. Sometimes I really feel like I didn't choose sport and, for, and performance psychology. I feel like it, it really chose me. And the reason I, I do that is because I really love seeing people reach their full potential. That's the thing that actually gives me the most, most joy. I love really the, the idea of viewing everything as a challenge and not as a threat.
And I, I really love seeing people, especially elite performers, whether they're in the military, whether they're in the FDNY, whether they're in playing baseball, or whether they're teaching, or whether they're in finance. I love seeing people recapture the idea of what it means to enjoy something the way that Pele did. This book, for me, is about gratitude. It's about me being thankful for, for being alive and sharing some of the practice of that with other people. And one of the things I do that I learned from my parents is I have a ritual about enjoyment where every day these two guys, gals, whether they like it or not, and they, they've learned to like it, I think. I tell myself that. <laughs> they, they tell me and then I tell them what they're grateful for. There's a lot of science behind that and we talk about that in the book. But it's also about really creating a level of connection to the moment. So lastly, um, I just want to share my gratitude with you guys. Uh, you know, this for me, more than anything, is to be able to connect with all of you and, and share my love for, for life as sport. I really, I really believe in the message of this book, which is it's about being great. But as I talk to athletes at the end of their career, Hall of Famers, people who've really reached the highest echelons. The thing that stands out to me is everybody says, I wish I enjoyed it more. When I talk to people retiring after 25 years of finance, after being an elite performer in a military setting, they always say to me, I wish I enjoyed it more. When I talk to people who are attorneys, when I talk to parents, they say, I wish I enjoyed that time more. This is a recipe, one of the many, for bringing out your best self. But it's also a bit of a roadmap for feeling more grateful and enjoying each moment of your life. So I really enjoyed the time that we spent together. And I really feel thankful that you guys came out on a Wednesday. It feels like a Saturday already, but it's a Wednesday. And I want to invite everybody. You know you're already invited. There are some serious surprises across the street at 817 Broadway. I mean, like, really crazy stuff is happening over there. Um, and uh, I want to invite everybody over to 817 Broadway to the 10th floor. I encourage you to support the Strand. This is really, I feel like, kind of where I grew up in a way. That and Forbidden Planet. Um, I won't get into that. It's a little bit too much inf personal information. <laughs> um, Thank you for coming. I'm, gonna, I'm just going to wrap up here, and then I think you know, Peter suggests that we take a few questions, and uh, maybe just a few, because I know we're going to sign some books. So thank you so much for coming out. You guys practiced well with that applause stuff. It actually worked. Questions, comments, yes. You can ask her. She's right here. <laughs> but no, my, my question for you is, uh, oh, my question for you is, uh, so how, how do you, I mean, I, I know this is what the book is for, but how do you, you know, enjoy yourself when you feel like, you know, what you're in the middle of, that if you don't succeed at it, that, you know, there's going to be like a huge consequence, you know, which I think is how a lot of us feel, which is why it's so tough to enjoy it while you're in it because you feel like if you can't get a positive result out of it then you know there's all these terrible things that are going to happen. So let's just get really practical here. What I want everybody to do to answer that excellent question by Bert is just do this for me one second. Okay. For just 60 seconds in whatever way you so choose I want you to just quiet your mind. I'm not going to tell you how. Just take 60 seconds to quiet your mind. Okay, so what I noticed around this room, I took a brief look. Mm, just from a glance, I'd say 80% of the people here closed their eyes. A lot of people I saw started regulating their breathing. Now, that's some of you guys have headspace and stuff like that, so you guys are sort of out of the analysis. You're working on it. There's an inherent relaxation response and practice that you can do. And the reason that I'm saying this is because when we talk about enjoyment, when I was stuck in the elevator, 
I was not in enjoyment mode. Okay, even though I could saw Jason, you know, I'm like, okay, so he'll, he'll pry this open with his teeth if it really gets that far. Um, I really felt, started to feel tense. And I started to feel like, I got to get up there. And, oh, man, how are people going to get from the front and to the back? And, you know, the strand staff is like, calm down. Everything's going to be okay. So, but I found that once I could quiet my mind, I could find myself again in that situation. So the things that were stressing me out seemed a little bit less stressful in some way. So that, that's one path to it. The other path to it is to create experiments, behavioral experiments, in the work that you do. Right? So I'll give you an example. In baseball, when someone's in a slump, sometimes I don't focus on the slump. Someone's in a slump, what I tell them is I say, listen, what I want you to do is I want you to be making the best practical jokes in the clubhouse. What I want you to do is I want you to be the first person up to high five someone out, 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 of, the, uh, you know, out of the dugout. Right? Because it changes your relationship with the task. If you're starting to overfocus on the outcome and not focus on the process of what you're doing, it, everything sucks, no matter what you're doing. Right? If it's all about the PL, if it's all about money, if it's all about the end game, everything that you do starts to fall apart. If it's really about saying, hey, let me experience, let me connect to people on my team. So let me give you a more pragmatic example. So um, you know anything about real estate? Yeah. Okay. So in real estate, um, I'm teasing him, but you know, in real estate, people get caught up in closing the deal. What I say is, and I give a whole talk to these real estate professionals, really is get caught up in the relationship, right? You, if you're worried and stressed out about what's going to happen, get caught up in how you make that relationship deeper because that can be fun. Worrying about what's going to happen at the end, ugh, that can be brutal, right? That's a great question. Let me take one more question. Yeah. Everybody you deal with, whether it, be, uh, whether it be athletes or whether it be people in business or actors, who would you say this is the most difficult for to overcome? This is like a fall in the trap question. I like this. <laughs> I'm going to look at this as a challenge and not as a threat. Right. It's sort of connected to the other question, which is sometimes I have people come in and they say, I just got to make this whatever amount of money I just got to it could be anything I got to make this relationship work and one of the some of the hardest folks to to really work with are the people that what I first do is I don't say anything about the goal I, I try to go to the motivation so what I say is well why interesting thing if you ask someone who's in the minor leagues of baseball why do you want to get to the big leagues universally universally they say I don't know it's always been my dream and in Spanish too, you know, say siempre quería ser así, siempre quería llegar a la Grande Liga. It's the same, right? And so, you know, what that tells me is they're not really connected with the motivation. So I'm working with someone who's trying to make a lot of money, is trying to, you know, make a relationship succeed, and I say to them, well, why? Why do you want to do that? And it's sort of an empty answer. Well, I don't know. I just want to do it. That's a hard person to work with. There's no gas in the tank, right? So what I always suggest to people is, if you have a goal. Like, think back to the goal that you came up with. Everybody think about that goal that you had, right? The thing you want to accomplish. Figure out, and we talk about that, I talk about that in the book, in, in the motivation chapter. I say, you know, well, why is it that you want to do that? Your power value, what is the reason? So it's really hard to work with someone else, and it's really hard for yourself if you don't clarify, why do you actually want to do it? Why do you want to write a book? I could never have sat here and written this book if I didn't know why. My why is I really want to get the message out about positive psychology, about strength-based work. Not just identifying what's wrong, but identifying what's right and how you build on that. That's my why. So every time I had writer's block, every time I had, you know, I wrote something that I thought was terrible, I was like, all right, let's keep going. Because I had that why. I was passionate about wanting to do it. So it's hard to work with yourself or someone else if you don't cultivate and have a discussion about what really motivates you at the most fundamental level. Yes. We, we, we get you a mic. Just hold on one second. We have a, we have a question right here. Is it like if it was always your dream, wouldn't that be like a why? Oh, sorry. That's an excellent why. Did you hear that, everybody? First of all, let's just support the courage it takes to ask a question like that, right? I'm so proud of you, man. Yes. So the question is, well, isn't that... I'm sorry, I'm blocking you. Is it, isn't that... Okay, so... Here's the question, right? I'm, I'm afraid you tell me if I'm wrong. But if it's my dream, does that help? 
right? We say that this is my dream to do this. Does that help? Absolutely. And the next question that we'd ask them, what do you think the next question we'd want to know about that is? Like someone says, yeah, that's my dream. What would we want to talk? What would we want to know about that? Well, why was it your dream? That's awesome. So impressed. So impressed. This is the last place I thought I'd be in this talk, and, and it's made everything worth it. Thank you. This is some good parenting, right? I mean, like, literally, Ben, Mick, ben Michaelis right here. Um, so, yeah, you want to know, like, why is it the person's dream? What makes it their dream? And so when you're going back to yourself and you have a goal that you want, don't stop there, right? Go deeper into the why. Why is it your dream? I want to I wanna wrap up and uh, just say that again. I'm going to sign some books, and um, I'm, we're going to go over and we're going to party. There is some crazy stuff happening across the street. <laughs> Who's here from Union Square Practice? Raise your hands. These people have created the craziest party across the street. You might not make it home. I'm not sure if that's an incentive to you to come or not, but anyway, it's the truth, full disclosure. I'm required to admit that to you. I just want... This has been a blast. I've had so much fun. I just want to thank you guys for, for coming out. And I look forward to partying with you across the street. So thank you so much.